Thank you for taking the time to watch this number one, the first one in what I am planning to have as a series of videos reviewing my debate with James White over the text and version issue. I am thankful to the one God, Jehovah, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for his blessing in my recent debate with um, Dr. White. I'm also thankful for everyone who prayed for me in the debate and for all those who contributed in a multitude of other ways. Without you, the case for the perfect preservation of scripture would have been much less effectively presented. So thank you very much for everyone who helped. Thank you for your help in advancing the Lord's glorious kingdom. Our debate was over the topic, the Legacy Standard Bible, as a representative of modern English translations based upon the United Bible Society's or Nestle Allen text, is superior to the King James Version as a representative of Texas Receptus-based Bible translations. And I believe that by God's grace and for his glory, the Lord answered the prayers of his people and the debate went well. God is concerned that his pure word be in use among his people, and I believe he blessed the debate towards the furtherance of that cause. Uh, we arrived in Tennessee the day before the debate, my wife and I. Our flights were fine on the way out and on the way back, although the plane went down at, when it got to the runway at the airport. Uh, my wife and I had dinner with James White the night before the debate, and we had a cordial conversation. I'm thankful for that. And we're also thankful for the help of a God, the King James only Baptist in the area, who helped us with things for making sure that we'd be able to project slides. Something was worked out with a pastor at the Reformed Baptist congregation where the debate was being held to a way to print my notes. Uh, the church had no printer available, nor was there any Wi-Fi for me to even have my notes on my iPad, which is why the debate wasn't live streamed, just recorded to be put up afterwards. Um, and by the way, I'm not criticizing the church for not having Wi-Fi or a printer. They're a smaller congregation, and that's how it goes, and that's fine. Uh, I'm very thankful that the debate was recorded by a professional videographer, and so it should be high quality once it comes out uh, in the relatively near future, Lord willing. And so uh, you can pray for the production of the video if you haven't seen it yet, if it's not out yet. Uh, the people at the Covenant Reformed Baptist Church of Tullahoma, Tennessee, were very kind to us. Uh, the pastor who makes a living rebinding Bibles presented us with a beautifully bound King James Version Bible. And he gave a beautifully bound Le Legacy Standard Bible to James White. So if you need a Bible rebound, he might be worth considering for you. Now, in my opinion, James White was not quite as cordial in the debate as he had been dinner the night before. But I suppose I will let you decide that when you watch the debate video, what you think about that. I was particularly struck by the fact that despite pressing James on the obvious fact that the Bible promises perfect preservation and that the original language texts behind the Legacy Standard Bible and similar modern versions are built around a rejection of those promises and that the recognition of the canonical words of scripture by the church were crucial to my case, James still did very little to dispute my case through scripture in order to present a biblical basis for his own position. That really struck me in the course of the debate. Uh, in fact, after reading in preparation for the debate, a great deal of his writing and watching a great number of his debates, I'm still not sure if he thinks there are any promises from the Bible that indicate that God would preserve every word that he inspired, or if James thinks that we have them, or almost all of them, somewhere because of what textual critics like Kurt Allen say, or at least what, according to James White, uh, textual critics like Kurt Allen say. Um, James' view of Kurt Allen and Allen's definition of tenacity may not be Kurt Allen's view of Kurt Allen and Kurt Allen's definition of tenacity. But in any case, I think the debate went well and that the case for perfect preservation and its good and necessary consequence, the superiority of the Texas Receptus and King James Version to the UBS and LSB was quite clear. Uh, however, I'm also aware that I'm biased in favor of my position. So you will have to watch the debate yourself and see if you agree or not. Now, the debate was not over whether one specific edition of the TR was perfect, and I think that is a worthwhile discussion once one accepts what scripture teaches on its own preservation, but it's not going to be nearly as beneficial of a discussion until one has the correct glasses on. Uh, faith in God's promises are those glasses you have to have on to evaluate the textual data. It seemed to me at times like James wanted to make the debate 
into one about whether a particular edition of the TR was perfect or not. But I believe that by the grace of God, uh, that wasn't allowed to happen. And I was able to keep the focus on what the actual debate topic was. Now, the slides that had been prepared, many of which were used in the debate, while others are not, are available at the main James White uh, Thomas Ross debate page at faithsaves.net if you want to get a sense of what my argument was or what's going to be on the debate video that should be coming up in the very near future, Lord willing. I asked James if he wished to put his slides up there as well so that both of our presentations had an equal representation, but at least uh, since I've asked him, um, he has not responded to that email or responded to me in any other way besides commenting me uh, about me on his dividing line program, which I will discuss shortly or dwelling. Uh, there's much more that could be said about the content of the debate, and I intend to put up a series of review videos discussing the arguments made on both sides, but that will have to wait until after the main video itself becomes available. So thank you again if you prayed for me. I appreciate that very much, and I do believe that the debate went very well. Uh, now, um, let me give glory to the one God, uh, the Father, who gave the canonical words of Scripture to the Son to give to the saints by the Spirit for how the debate went. I do praise the one God for that and rejoice in uh, the defense of his truth that was manifest in the debate. Um, I would love to end this video here with giving praise to the one God for what he did in glorifying his truth in the debate. But someone brought to my attention that on James's Dividing Line program uh, for Tuesday, February 21, 2023, James made some comments on the debate. And uh, I do believe I should respond to them. I think that would honor the Lord. And he discusses the debate from about minute five to about the 18 minute mark. So that's about how long he discusses the debate that we had. And in relation to James's debate review comments, I was surprised that James made very few comments about the substance of our debate. So James did not talk about what scripture taught about its own preservation. He did not talk about what Baptist confessions say about preservation. He did not talk about the case I made from history about how God kept his promises and the Baptist confessions and how they are correct in what they teach on this topic. Uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, instead he made regular affirmations about my character that, at least in my mind, he was not able to substantiate. Uh, James said that he, quote, knew, unquote, that I was, quote, not intending to, quote, bring the audience along with me. That was minute nine into his comments. He claimed I had a, quote, really, really deep disrespect for the audience. Uh, 16 minutes into his comments, he said, quote, Ross didn't care. He wasn't debating for us. 13 minutes in. He claimed that this is what I was doing, quote. I don't care if anyone understands what I'm saying. I'm just showing off, unquote, 17 minutes in. So there's, those are some quotes that he made about uh, the debate. Uh, now, let me share with you what is the most important thing that I will say in this entire video. So don't let the world, don't let the flesh, and don't let the devil keep, get you to tune this out, okay? Uh, pay very close attention to the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, in the Bible. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's verses 1 through 7, and let's go down to the conclusion in verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So James's assertions that 
I had a quote, really, really deep disrespect for the audience that I was quote, just showing off that I quote, didn't care, et cetera, are very serious. After all, if I was not doing what I was doing out of love for God and for those who would be in the physical and virtual audience, then 1 Corinthians 13 says that my many hours of preparation, my reading James's books, my watching James's debates, my flying across the country and spending several days getting out there and getting back, my buying books and reading articles, my dialoguing, my dialoguing with scholars in the field of textual criticism, my spending lots of time preparing materials to make my presentation user-friendly and so on is all for nothing. If I didn't do it out of love, if I did it just to show off, that would be useless in vain. Uh, my prayers for the physical and virtual audiences in the debate were then simply hypocrisy that was rejected by the infinitely holy God. Um, now, during my opening presentation, uh, the Lord's glorious promises about the preservation of his word impacted me to the extent that I had to fight off tears. But if, if James is correct, then that too must have been fake. It must have just been a show. Now, these are serious allegations that James is making about me. And in light of 1 Corinthians 13's command, that charity or love thinketh no evil, beareth all things, believeth all things, endureth all things, and hopeth all things, James presumably must believe that he has compelling enough evidence for these allegations about my character that he thought that instead of discussing the content of the debate, he should spend his time on a video that is going to be available to billions of people on the internet attacking my character in this way. Now, not one of the allegations that James made about me even entered my mind until I listened to him make them in the dividing line. But we should not just pick whoever we want to believe and say, well, I think James is more credible. I think Thomas is more credible. So we're going to believe James here, believe Thomas here. That isn't really the way we should evaluate it. What we should do is we should go to scripture and scripture provides us tests of how to evaluate accusations in passages such as Deuteronomy 17, 6, Deuteronomy 19, 15 to 19, Matthew 18, 16, 1 Timothy 5, 19 and others. And we should employ those passages to evaluate the evidence that James brings forth for his statements. Now, what God thinks of me is, is crucially important. What James thinks of me is, is not nearly so important, but regardless of whatever James thinks about my character, I don't want people who watch the debate to have their minds set against what I'm saying because of James's allegations, unless it gives sufficient evidence to overcome uh, what 1 Corinthians 13 teaches is the default position of love where we think the best of others. So. What James thinks about me is not important, but what the Bible teaches about its own preservation, which is the central issue in the King James TR position and modern versions uh, debate and with their, uh, you know, the original language texts and the, the translation there, that is very important. So this is a very important issue. And so for the glory of the divine author of the word of God, I believe I need to evaluate the evidence that James provides for his claims so that people can see if they should dismiss my argument out of hand because of my alleged bad character. And I, I will not mention this further, but we should also consider if it's a logical fallacy to dismiss someone's argument because of his character, or if attacking a person's character in order to get a person to dismiss his argument is a valid way of making argument, or if that is fallacious. I think that is worth at least considering as a possibility. Now, I must confess that I feel like much of what uh, I am kind of forced to discuss here is rather petty and trivial, but James has done 180 debates. And in his view, uh, these things were the most important matters to bring the, to the attention of his audience about the debate. So perhaps he sees something in the importance of these allegations and the evidence for them that he offers that I must confess I fail to see. But then again, uh, none of the accusations that he made about me even entered my mind before I heard him make them. So it may not be uh, likewise surprising that I was unequated with the evidence that he brings forth for them. In any case, what evidence did James bring forth to establish his uh, accusations? The only evidence that I could gather, at least, for his assertion that he, quote, knew that I was, quote, not intending to bring the audience along with me is that he said that I spoke too quickly and that I had a large number of slides. 
Now, he directed his listeners to my website, faithsaves.net, and repeated three times the number of slides that he claimed I had, uh, emphasizing the number. Um, and this isn't that big of a deal, but he did get the number of slides wrong every single time, as can be verified by simply checking the link at the place where James said to look for it. Um, he was way off in the number, but that isn't really that important. Um, I would like to suggest, though, that the more likely reason for my making lots of slides than the one that James suggested is specifically to bring the audience along and to make sure that they did understand what I was saying rather than the reverse. Some of my slides had a little bit of text. Some of them had a lot of text. And I would like to suggest that the ones that had a lot of text with some of it in bold print was so that people could get the context and get what is most important in my quotations. I also frequently put sources on my slides so people can look up the context and verify what I'm saying. Because God is a God of truth, I believe that being accurate and careful and documenting what I say is very important in uh, my speeches and writing to glorify the Lord, uh, the God of truth. Um, and I must also confess that with um, all that is crucially important in this issue of the preservation of God's words, I do feel rather silly having to discuss how many slides I made. But again, James seems to think this was the crucial thing to discuss in the debate review, uh, at least from what he talked about. Uh, James went on to say that my having lots of slides is, quote, so absurd that I don't even know how to comment on it, unquote. Well, here is a suggestion for how um, maybe he could comment on it. He could have said something like this. Thank you, uh, Brother Ross, for being well prepared. Thank you for preparing so many slides so that people can understand what is going on. Thank you for being careful to document your claims. Thank you for reading my books for watching my debates, for searching the scriptures, for examining historical data, for having slides prepared for every objection that I was going to make ahead of time so that people could understand my argument and what, what the perfect preservationist response to it is. Thank you for doing that. That would be one way to comment on it, and I think that would be a good way. So maybe having lots of slides really isn't that absurd after all. Now, James also said that I had a tendency to speak fast sometimes, especially, and that's true. He's right about that. I do that, especially when I know I have a specific time limit. I do have a tendency to speak fast. I try to watch out for that tendency, and sometimes I'm successful, and sometimes I'm less successful. Now, if our debate were over who has more debate experience and could do a better job timing things, James would surely win. No doubt about it. He's a very experienced debater. I did ask someone on my side in the debate after my opening presentation if I was speaking too fast or if what I was saying could be followed, and the person said I was fine, and I do have some confidence in the judgment of that person that I asked. In any case, uh, if you watch the debate and you think that I spoke too fast, well, please pardon me and pray for me to get better at public speaking. Um, but I at least have not been convinced by James's statements that I spoke too fast and had too many slides with too much information because I committed the sin of really, really deep disrespect for the audience just doing the debate to, quote, show off and that I, quote, didn't care and wasn't debating for us and so on. Um, now, here is a word of encouragement for you. If you are able to follow what I said in the debate, then according to James, you must be a very smart person as he said that he couldn't do it. So if you understand the argument that I was making in the debate and you can follow it, then good job. Uh, you are doing great. Um, I, I would like to consider, you know, did I speak too fast? I, I'm, I'm not convinced that I did. Now, if you watch the debate for yourself and see it, while James claims it was incomprehensible, I think that the large majority of people who are born again Christians will be able to follow what I was saying. I actually believe that if you're born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and are not resisting or quenching the Holy Spirit, you will not only be able to follow my argument, but I believe that the Holy Ghost dwelling in you and your own renewed nature will be crying out, Amen, as I am explaining and expositing what Scripture teaches on its own preservation and its good and necessary consequences between uh, in this debate between the received text and the text rejected by the church, but defended by James. 
Uh, now, James claims that the audience couldn't follow what I was saying. I do confess that I got a very different impression. I got the sense that they could follow it and that what scripture taught, namely that uh, that and the scripture, of course, is the living, the powerful, the, the blessed sword of the spirit. I believe that that sword of the spirit, the word of God, was impacting them as I explained to them the basis for the Christian and Baptist doctrine of preservation and how that doctrine settles the textual controversy in favor of the beloved and received and used and memorized and meditated upon Texas Receptus and against the text James is defending, which you could call a textus rejectus. Is it possible that James's claims that the audience could not follow what I was saying is more likely to be truly disrespectful to the audience than my speaking too fast and having lots of slides with lots of information? I think that is uh, something to at least consider. Now, as James indicated, um, he said, quote, Ross didn't care. He wasn't debating for us. I found James's evidence for this claim quite astonishing. What was his evidence that I didn't care about the audience and wasn't debating for them? It was my ecclesiology. So I, I find it quite surprising that at least as far as I can understand from James's declarations in his video, uh, that my views of Baptist ecclesiology are sufficient evidence that I, quote, didn't care and, quote, wasn't debating for us. Perhaps the connection between my doctrine of the church and my internal motives is very clear in James's mind, but at least from his video, I was not clear about the logical connection and I was not able to follow it. Now, James defined my ecclesiology as believing, quote, historically absurd stuff, unquote, 13 minutes in, and believing a, quote, secret church, unquote, 15 minutes in. But in case that's not a sufficient explanation for what my ecclesiology is, you could say that a Baptist who recognizes church succession, like I do, believes the following things. He believes, first of all, that the word church, ecclesia in the Greek New Testament, refers to the local congregation not something universal and visible or universal and invisible, or something secret for that matter. Uh, so the Greek word for church uh, never unambiguously refers to something universal or something invisible, but is overwhelmingly used in the New Testament for Christ's local congregation. And in two instances, it's used for an assembly of idolaters in Acts 19, and in one text, Ecclesia in Acts chapter 7 is used for Israel being assembled in the wilderness. So the church is an assembly, a congregation, and so it must actually be able to assemble in one place with local, visible, real people. So that's the first thing I believe about the doctrine of the church. Secondly, I believe that the church is an ecclesiological and not a soteriological realm. So Baptists of my persuasion reject the Catholic dogma that outside the visible church there is no salvation. And we also reject the Protestant dogma that outside of the invisible church, there is no salvation, as we do not believe that the invisible unity of all believers is the church. We refer to the unity of all believers as the unity of God's family in the kingdom of God, while the church is local and visible. So we call the family of God the universal entity, and we restrict the church term to the local assembly of visible saints. And thirdly, we believe as a good and necessary consequence of Christ's promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church in Matthew 16, 18, and that he would be with his church always, his assembly of baptized believers, until the end of the world in Matthew 28, 20, that there have always been assemblies of born-again believers practicing believers' immersion. So we rejoice when anyone, whatever his ecclesiology is, we rejoice that when anyone preaches a true gospel, but we do not believe that they're Christ's churches unless they have the doctrine and historical heritage of the church that the Lord Jesus started himself in the first century. So we agree, in other words, with Charles Spurgeon when he declared, quote, we hold the pure, primitive, ancient apostolic faith. We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin was born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it but we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ in our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten, 
like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherents. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others, nor I believe any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of others under the control of man. And he keeps going. That's from Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit Sermons, Volume 7, page 225, Public Meeting of Our London Baptist Brethren. So uh, we believe what Spurgeon believes about Baptist succession. And we rejoice that God has kept his promises to preserve his churches, just like he kept his promises to preserve his words. So that is what a, quote, landmark Baptist, unquote, believes in case James's statement that we believe in, quote, historically absurd stuff didn't quite make it clear enough for you. And you can learn more about what we believe scripture teaches about ecclesiology and church succession in the ecclesiology section at faithsaves.net if, if this piques your interest. Now, um, uh, I'm not quite sure why agreeing with Spurgeon on Baptist succession and taking a view that the word church or ecclesia means something local and visible in the New Testament, just like it does in the LXX, just like it does in all extant literature that predates Christ's usage in Matthew 16, 18 and 18, 20, which is a fact not only recognized by Spurgeon, but by giants of the Baptist faith of like D.H. Carroll, other luminaries of Baptist history. Um, I'm not sure why taking this ecclesiological view proves, quote, Ross didn't care, unquote, and, quote, he wasn't debating for us. So I do convince, um, I, I am convinced uh, that, um, well, I'm not convinced. I, I'm convinced that, that what he's saying is, is just not true, but, but I, I don't find James's evidence especially convincing at this point. And let me point out as well that James in the debate did nothing to show that on any view of the church, any view of ecclesiology, the United Bible Society's Nestle Allen Greek text he was defending is the text of the church. So the fact is, whether one takes a Catholic ecclesi ecclesiological position, a Protestant ecclesiological position, a universal church uh, Baptist ecclesiological position, a landmark Baptist ecclesiological position, or any other ecclesiology of which I'm aware, the Texas Receptus is still the text of the church. And since God's word promises that the church would receive the true words of God, the TR must still be right. And the UBS Nestle Allen text must still be wrong because the Bible says that the true churches would receive the true words of God. And those are where, that's how we know where the canonical words are and the canonical books of scripture are. Now, James did notice, as he pointed out in his debate review, that I kept saying that God's word would be available to the church in every generation. So at least he got... He got something right in uh, my, um, despite my having lots of slides and, and speaking fast and all that, he did get something important in my presentation. I, I appreciate that. He did understand what scripture teaches about the preservation of God's word through the church. So I'm glad he understood that. Now, the Nestle Allen UBS text was not available to the church, whether you're a landmark Baptist whether you're a Protestant Baptist, whether you're a Presbyterian, whether you're an Anglican, whatever you are, however you define the church, that NAUBS text wasn't available for huge portions of church history, while the Texas Receptus text type was. So I'm thankful that in my allegedly extremely difficult to follow presentation, James got something that I kept emphasizing by repetition. I would also like to point out uh, just one other thing in that regard, that... Um, in relation to how this definition of the church topic impacts bibliology and the doctrine of preservation, even if one, uh, I believe clearly and correctly, believes that Baptists are Protestants and they did originate only at the time of the Reformation, someone who takes seriously what scripture teaches about the reception of God's word by his church should at least consider what non-Roman Catholic Christians such as the Waldensians had in their hands as they worshiped the Lord free from the superstitions uh, of the Roman church. Um, and so I would say that confessional Baptists, even if they don't take a landmark Baptist view of the church, if they take a Protestant view, a universal invisible church view, they should at least consider what, what the text was that was in use by, by Christians that were separated from what uh, confessional statements view as the papal Antichrist. So surely the Bible in use by Christians that are not affiliated with the Antichrist should be considered along with the Bible uh, in use by those that are in uh, the religious organization uh, that is headed by an antichrist. That would seem, uh, even if you don't take 
uh, my view of the church as, as solely a local uh, invisible institution, while the family of God is universal, what the non-Catholic Christians thought would seem to at least be worthy of consideration. Uh, so, for example, the Waldens and Bible have church five seven things like that. So that is important to me. But I think even if you aren't, uh, don't take my position, that is still something worthy of consideration. So in any case, uh, I did not find James's argument that, quote, I didn't care and, quote, wasn't doing the debate for, unquote, the audience, because I'm a landmark Baptist, especially convincing. Indeed, what struck me in James's statement was that he didn't know my ecclesiology. He said he didn't know before the debate what, what my position was. It sounded like, uh, for whatever reason, he might have been too busy, uh, for whatever the reason was, it sounds to me like from that statement that he didn't prepare especially deeply for the debate. Um, finding out basics about my doctrinal convictions is not especially difficult. He could have seen a good number of the slides and much of my argument ahead of time by looking at my writings on my website or in previous times, uh, looking at previous times I've taught on the text issue on the King James Bible, six, KJB 1611 YouTube channel, or the KJ Bible 1611 Rumble channels, he could have looked there and, and seen a lot of the stuff I presented ahead of time. Um, and I believe it is, is unfortunate that uh, this preparation, at least as far as I can tell, did not take place. And I'm not convinced that my spending a great deal of time preparing for the debate, um, as far as I can tell, more than James did, uh, is uh, from his lack of knowledge about my positions, I'm not convinced that my spending that time of preparation and doing those things is evidence of, quote, absurdity or evidence of, quote, deep, deep disrespect, uh, rather than being evidence of my honoring the divine author of scripture, the author of the divine and uh, divinely inspired and preserved word, and actually honoring James by, by studying his writings and honoring both the physical audience and the virtual audience. So my view of those things is, is that it's actually honoring not dishonoring or even deeply, deeply dishonoring that I did those things. Now, 14 minutes into James's response, he seems to say, at least if I understand what he said correctly, that uh, he seemed to say that I don't understand the concept of text types or, quote, anything like that at all. So, and I, quote, misuse scholarly information, unquote. Now, since my slides actually give the sources for what I'm arguing, I will let the debate viewer decide if I'm misusing scholarly information or not. You can look them up, take a look, and evaluate it for yourself. Uh, now, James was just doing a short discussion of our debate, so maybe in some separate video, he will give evidence in writing or uh, in you know, speaking or in some way of how I am um, allegedly misusing scholarly information, as at least in his debate review video, he didn't give any examples at all of my misusing anything. Um, so. Uh, at least from this video, I was unable to clearly determine how James reached the conclusion that I did not understand the concept of text types or even, quote, anything like that at all. I didn't even get close to understanding the concept of text types as far as I can tell. That appears to be James's assertion. Um, now, James did go on to say that some people think that if they can find a, quote, single Byzantine reading, that they think this makes a manuscript a, quote, Byzantine manuscript, unquote. Now, in the debate, of course, I never made the argument that a single Byzantine reading in a huge manuscript full of Alexandrian readings uh, supposedly makes their manuscript a Byzantine manuscript. I never said that, of course. And so perhaps James is just speaking about other people uh, other than me who supposedly have done this, uh, even though um, he was talking about me immediately before these statements. So it'd be reasonable to think he's still talking about me when he makes them. Now, in his King James Only Controversy book, he also speaks about King James, King James, blah, blah, King James only people who allegedly believe that Abraham and Moses spoke English. Uh, and he has no documentation for that claim as well. So I do wish that James would provide documentation for these King James only advocates who think that one Byzantine reading means a manuscript is really a Byzantine manuscript. And I'd also like to see the documentation for the other King James only people who believe that Abraham and Moses spoke English. Uh, so we wouldn't need to just take his word for it that these people exist, even though they seem to be very, very hard to find. Now, I was thinking about how James could have drawn the conclusion that I thought that one Byzantine reading made a manuscript a Byzantine manuscript, if indeed that is what he thinks I believe. Uh, I did point out in the debate that when he asked about Athanasius, that Athanasius consistently quotes only begotten son in John 1.18. That's something I pointed out instead of quoting, quote, only begotten God 
which is the reading employed by Arius and the Watchtower Society, the Jehovah's False Witness Organization. And that reading, Only Begotten God, is the reading contained in the New World Translation, as well as in the Legacy Standard Bible and in the Nestle Allen UBS Greek text. My point here is, uh, as Hort himself pointed out in his discourse on Monogenes Theos, that Athanasius seven times quotes Only Begotten Son, the received text in King James Version reading of John 1.18. Athanasius does this in his defense of the Nicene definition and in his discourses against the Arians. He never quotes Only Begotten God, which is a reading that is first attested by the Gnostic Valentinians, and it is also quoted by Arius himself. And it's also quoted by some others with better theology as well. But it's, uh, and then it is adopted by the modern Arians, the, the Watchtower Society, and it disgraces uh, and defiles the Living Standard Bible and the Nestle Allen UBS text in John 1.18. Uh, as Burgon pointed out in his Causes of Corruption of the Gospels, quote, Arius reads Theos, God, while his opponents read Huios, Son, unquote. So this only begotten God corruption, as reproduced in the Nestle Allen UBS text, appears in 0.3% of the Greek manuscript evidence, while the TR uh, reading only begotten son appears in 99% of the manuscript evidence. And it is actually astonishing to me that in James's King James Only Controversy book, he actually employs the pro-Aryan corruption of John 1.18 as an example of the superiority of the modern Bible versions on the deity of Christ, which is another reason I employed this passage in the debate. Now, James may not like the fact that I pointed out this one very important reading in our debate where Athanasius agrees with me, but let me mention that pointing out one specific reading um, of Athanasius is actually one more reading than James White himself points out. So in our debate, he pointed out zero evidences from Athanasius's quotations of scripture, and I pointed out one. And my point was not that Athanasius' Greek text looks identical to a printed 1550 Stephanus Texas Receptus edition, um, although it certainly also did not look like a, um, it wasn't identical to a Nestle Allen printed uh, 27th or 28th edition uh, either. Um, Athanasius' text may have been more complicated than either of those two alternatives. Um, what is more, I would point out that James did not cite any patristic writer who comes from Asia Minor, where so many of the autographs were actually written, but and a record where, which is also a recognized stronghold of the Byzantine text type, the TR text type. But he quotes a patristic writer who lived far away from there in Egypt, uh, in a region that never had any autographical text. So uh, would it not have been better for James to have said, quote, while all the patristic writers who lived in the region of the world from which we got a huge proportion of the autographs, uh, namely Asia Minor, quote, a Byzantine type text as far back as the extant evidence goes, I'm going to ask Thomas about the text of Athanasius, who lived in Egypt, far away from where the autographs were given by inspiration. That would be one way you could put the question. Uh, and now in any case, my citing an actual TR reading on a crucial text where the Nestle Allen text and the LSV by corrupting John 118 into only begotten God and thus encouraging the Arian heresy that Christ is begotten in the sense of created at a point of time as a secondary deity, rather than the biblical fact that Christ is begotten eternally as son, and beget doesn't mean create, the son is begotten, not created. But that's about as much a discussion of Athanasius and his text as we were likely to get done in debate format. So I quoted one reading, he quoted no readings. That's about as far as you're going to get in the limited time you've got. Now, certainly my point from Athanasius' text of John 1.18 looks, to, at least to me, it looks like a very slim basis to prove that I don't know what text types are. Uh, hopefully, that is not the conclusion that James was making, uh, though it, I think people could have concluded that from his, his video. Now, he also mentioned that, uh, you know, he would put himself in the category of people who do textual criticism. And he said that people who, uh, quote, people who don't do textual criticism, unquote, which is, I believe, what he's putting me in the category of, get confused on these things and, quote, misrepresent them, unquote, uh, by doing things like saying that one Byzantine reading makes a large manuscript uh, a Byzantine manuscript. And so we do this in our alleged ignorance of what a text type even is. Now, it is one thing for James to make such allegations 
and it is another thing to prove them. And I am not convinced that he was able to successfully prove that allegation. Now, in minutes 15 to 16 of this discussion, in a way that's impossible for someone who has not watched the debate to understand, James referenced what I pointed out in the quote, Swanson, unquote. Now, this is an oblique reference to the fact that I pointed out something very powerful from the four volumes of Reuben Swanson's New Testament Greek manuscripts, variant readings arranged in horizontal lines against Codex Vaticanus. So I gave 41 examples, merely from the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, where the NAUBS text, in mere handfuls of words, has no Greek manuscript support whatsoever. So just handfuls of words, there is no single manuscript on the face of the earth that we're aware of that, that exists that has those specific words just for short phrases. And there's, there's many of these in the Nestle Allen UBS text. Now in the debate, at least at first, James strenuously denied that what I said was true. But anyone who gets these books can go through them and look for the lines where the bold letter U appears with no other manuscript next to it. And where that bold letter U appears, that means that the UBS text has no textual support for that line of, of um, that, that line as a whole line. Um, now, it is a bit time consuming to go through those books. It's hundreds of pages, it takes some work, but I thought it was important in preparation for the debate to do it. I would have liked to do Luke and John, but I ran out of time before getting there. So I just did Matthew and Mark before, before the debate. But uh, while that's a bit time consuming, it's not especially difficult. Just go through, find the use. Uh, but what I said was one, 100% accurate and 0% inaccurate on this topic. So Swanson himself said exactly what I said in his preface. And I quoted on my slide uh, the exact words of Swanson with a page number where you can go and read it for yourself. So uh, the fact is that there are hundreds of lines of text in the Nestle Allen of mere handfuls of words where it looks like no Greek manuscript that is actually known on the face of the earth. In contrast, the TR text type looks exactly like large numbers of manuscripts and very, very similar to many more over the course of entire books of scripture. In the debate, I gave examples from the book of Titus of TR text type manuscripts that are exactly identical for the whole book manuscripts that are from different centuries in different parts of the world with no genealogical connection that are identical over the course of the whole book of Titus. They illustrate the fantastically careful copying that scribes copying TR-type manuscripts were engaged in, and how carefully in the providence of God TR-type manuscripts were passed on from generation to generation. Now, I ran out of time, and so I didn't have time in the, the debate to get into this, but my slide presentation also pointed out 37 manuscripts of 3rd John collated by Dr. Wilbur Pickering, which are completely identical to the printed 1550 Stephanus Texas Receptus. So such facts like these powerfully illustrate and validate the fulfillment of God's promises of perfect preservation in the text of the church and thus in the Texas Receptus. While they powerfully illustrate and validate that the LSB's Greek text and the NAUBS uh, that it is, is based on doesn't fit the promises of scripture, but is a corrupt textus rejectus. Now, I wonder if, as James admitted in his debate review, that at first he did not know what I was talking about when I pointed out the facts in Swanson, uh, because either he was unaware of them himself, or at the very least, he was not telling his audience about these things. James said in the debate that he owned Swanson, but he never said that he was aware of what I pointed out uh, that was in Swanson. Uh, if you regularly watch James's dividing line, which, which, which I don't, I'm sure that can, there can be value from that, but I don't do it. And now let me ask you, if you're a regular dividing line watcher, uh, does James make it clear regularly to his audience that there are mere handfuls of words hundreds of times in the UBS that look like no manuscript on the face of the earth, while the TR text type looks like many manuscripts. Now, maybe he does make that clear, but I at least have not heard it. And I have not seen him admit this fact in 
uh, in his books or in his published debates. So uh, if there's any evidence that James was aware of this fact before our debate, I would love to see it in writing. It would be something important to be aware of. If one is going to be a leading anti-TRKJVO person for decades, it would seem like this would be something that would be good to know. Now, I don't want to jump to hasty conclusions. And I can't say that James didn't know this before our debate, for sure. I, I, I can't prove that. But I'm quite certain that whatever James himself knew or did not know about this, the vast majority of the debate audience certainly did not know it. And contrary to James's affirmation that I didn't care about them, I actually did care about them and do care about them and really wanted them to get this, which is why I pointed it out. Now, let me point out one more thing. James said that the debate was, quote, really, really disappointing, unquote. He said it was, quote, really, really disappointing, unquote, because of my, quote, really, really deep disrespect for the audience, unquote. Now, there is one thing that I actually appreciate in this statement by James. James never said that I disrespected him. And that's because I never did in the debate or before the debate in the restaurant or after the debate as we discuss things with the people in the audience where the debate was held. I point out that I spent a lot of time after the debate discussing things with people in the audience, uh, by the way, as well. And none of the debate audience breathed a hint to me that I was deeply, dis deeply disrespecting to them at any point in my conversations with uh, the kind people at that congregation after our debate. Our conversations were cordial, our conversations were respectful, our conversations were appropriate for Christians. So uh, no nobody there uh, told me that I was deeply, deeply disrespecting the audience. Uh, I also sought through the whole debate to consistently be polite and kind to James and to the host pastor in light of what we see like in 2 Timothy 2, uh, where, where the sermon of the Lord is not to strive, but to be gentle and, and uh, patient towards all men. So that's that was my goal. Um, I even actually brought, brought both James and uh, uh, the host pastor there. I brought them both two gifts, all the way from San Francisco where we live, all the way to Tennessee. I brought them and gave them some gifts just to show affection, just to show uh, respect and kindness uh, to them. So James never pointed out any of that uh, that I did in his debate review. But at least he didn't say that I was disrespectful to him personally or to the pastor. And I do appreciate that he never said that, that, that I was disrespectful to them but because I wasn't. So I do appreciate that. Now, whether I showed really, really deep disrespect for the audience by preparing deeply for the debate, by having lots of visuals, and by trying to give the audience as many facts as I could in the time that I had is something that I am I'm willing to leave that to the righteous judge of all to determine at the last day. And I will leave it to those who have watched the debate in the physical audience or to those who will watch it in the virtual audience to evaluate it as well uh, in the meantime before that final day of judgment. Uh, I will say that my conscience is clear about it. Uh, although if James intended his statements as a needed rebuke to me, I do appreciate his taking the time to rebuke me for what he believes was my sinfully speedy speaking and my sinfully numerous visuals. So I, if, if he really thinks that, I, I, I thank him for that, um, for, for making that statement. Now, James never brought up my allegedly, quote, really, really deep disrespect during the debate. He never, never brought that up. In the debate, he never said my attitude was, quote, I don't care if anyone understands. Excuse me. Drink some water. If you drink this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink the water Jesus gives, you'll never thirst. Great argument for eternal security. In any case, um, back to the point here. In the debate, he never said that my attitude was, quote, I don't care if anyone understands what I'm saying. I'm just showing off, unquote. He only mentioned that afterwards in the review on the dividing line. Now, of course, if James had made those statements during the debate itself, I would have had the opportunity to respond. And the live audience would have been able to evaluate the validity or the lack thereof of his claim at the time. But in any case, James claimed that he was very disappointed by the debate because of my allegedly deep, deep disrespect, my showing off, my lack of understanding of what a text type even was, my evil motives for doing the debate without any care for the people present, and so on. Now, I cannot prove that James thinks this, and it would be foolish of me to affirm that I can read James' mind or determine his motives. But whatever's going on in his mind, 
I think that for at least many advocates of the Nestle Allen UBS text and of the LSB, at least those who are not willing to change, uh, I think that many of them will be really disappointed by watching the debate, not for the reasons that James alleges, but because the debate demonstrates that the Nestle Allen UBS text violates scripture's promises on preservation, violates the teaching of century after century after century of Baptist confessions, clashes with the doctrines of verbal plenary inspiration and the doctrine of verbal plenary preservation, and contradicts the historical evidence. I think it is quite probable that a much higher percentage of advocates of modern versions who watch the debate will be, quote, disappointed for these reasons than those who will be, quote, disappointed by being convinced of James's allegations about my character and motives. At least some of those who advocate the uh, Texas Rejectus may just see that they need to change and adopt the text of the church, uh, the Old and New Testament Texas Receptus and the Bible in English translated from it, the authorized King James Version. To those who are not willing to go in that direction, I can see why the debate would be very, very disappointing. Now, on James's program, he regularly criticizes King James-only people for ignorance, for making unsubstantiated claims, and for just saying stuff that's not true. I rather suspect that at least for some of those of the audience of the dividing line and some of those who are going to watch this debate, they're now going to conclude that I'm being criticized for being too well prepared, for having too much substance and having too much information. Now, what James does not point out in his debate review, and I'm thankful that he doesn't make this statement, is James never says in his review that one fact that I pointed out in my presentation is false. He didn't make that statement in his review anywhere. Not one fact is false. He accuses me as a person of all kinds of things, but he never refutes one specific piece of information that I brought up. Uh, maybe that says a lot about how bad I am and how we need to emphasize this, uh, but James never proves or even attempts to prove in the, what he said about the debate that my arguments or my facts or my exegesis of scripture were false. And I think that tells you something important about how the debate went. Now, don't just assume that I'm right or that James is right. I'll watch the debate, verify the sources provided, and do so humbly and prayerfully with an open Bible, an open mind, an open heart, and a childlike faith and dependence upon God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you do so, Whatever conclusions you believe you need to draw about my character and about James' allegations, you will receive the blessing promised in Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and tremble at my word. Have that attitude as you watch the debate, please. Thank you very much. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.